Yeah, so my talk is titled uh, Geometry from Quantum Matter and Quantum Matter from Geometry. So you know, the moment you hear the word quantum, you think physics, uh, rightly so. Uh, you know, I regard myself as a pure mathematician and then a geometer at heart. Uh, but uh, you know, one of the things I've been thinking about lately is how pure mathematics and geometry in particular um, overlap uh, and contribute to some areas of physics where pure mathematics hasn't had um, a major uh, impact traditionally. And that's part of uh, what uh, the Quanta Lab is all about. Before I begin, I just want to say that you know, where I am in, uh, in Canada is, uh, happens to be Treaty 6 territory and the homeland of the Métis. Uh, so I just want to pay respect to the First Nations and Métis ancestors of this place and uh, reaffirm uh, uh, my relationship uh, with, with the peoples of this place. So um, this uh, lab uh, is the Center for Quantum Topology and, uh, and its applications, uh, Quanta for, for short. Uh, it's a GLU lab. It's also a, a Pacific Institute for the Mathematical Sciences a collaborative uh, research group. Um, it involves uh, six uh, universities, and, and then we have uh, 15 faculty from, uh, drawn from six universities uh, in Canada. And there are uh, 30 or more research students uh, associated uh, to our lab through the various faculty who populate it. So uh, just to situate us, where are we? So here's North America. And uh, the lab, um, as I said, is you know six different universities, but uh, the, maybe one of the core hubs is in uh, Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, at the University of Saskatchewan. And that's uh, the red dot that you see on the map, just, just to situate us. So this is uh, the University of Saskatchewan campus, uh, although uh, most of the year it, it looks like this. And uh, this is a pretty representative picture, except for the fact that the campus is still in lockdown. And so you, wouldn't, you would just see the environment and, and know people uh, trying to make their way through the cold. So uh, the lab has a dedicated lab space uh, under construction at uh, USASC, I'm happy to say. And that's uh, partly funded by a Canada Foundation for Innovation grant that we received. So include student collaboration space. Uh, the funding also gets us dedicated high performance computing uh, that uh, students uh, and others will be able to access from the space. We have uh, desktop 3D printing resources in-house. Uh, we have, uh, for instance, a raised 3D, uh, 3D printer that we use. We also have access to a, a rapid prototyper in, uh, in the university's College of Engineering. Uh, so this is, uh, this is uh, you know, if you like, um, prototype and machine grade uh, photopolymer uh, material-based uh, printing. And we also have um, a special facility that, that uh, on the campus, which is this, the synchrotron. This is uh, the Canada light source, and it's the brightest light in Canada. And uh, this is just some of the infrastructure that, uh, that we have access to here. Of course, I'm, I'm emphasizing printing um, because that's, uh, you know, I think a major theme across uh, Geometry Labs United is uh, sort of manufacturing geometries uh, physically in, in three dimensions in, in many different ways. This is a picture of the space that is uh, being built. Um, parts of it are, are heavily, this is a floor plan, but parts of it are heavily inspired by uh, the Mason Experimental Geometry Lab, which I had the fortune of visiting right before the pandemic hit. Uh, that was a good experience. And uh, so this is in, in progress at the moment. So here's a, one of our past students, uh, Sandeep, uh, holding Something, something small, a uh, slice of, uh, of a Calabiao manifold, which was printed uh, using the, the 3D prototyping uh, tool, the rapid prototyping tool in, in engineering. Now, uh, you know, what is it that we do? Yeah, we, we love to um, you know, print and, and grow uh, different geometries, but uh, this has a purpose in mind, and uh, we see what our lab does as pure mathematics meets uh, condensed matter physics and also nanoengineering. So we're, we're interested in geometry and topology around a central theme, 
and that's uh, maybe geometry at ultra cold temperatures. So part of this is uh, visualizing um, what might be referred to as condensed matter or quantum condensed matter, but also predicting uh, and engineering through geometry new types of quantum matter, which could have applications as far reaching as quantum computing and, and quantum sensors. So this is sort of uh, trying, to, trying to use and leverage geometry uh, towards certain, uh, certain applications in quantum physics. So the place to begin with this is, is maybe to ask the question, uh, what are topological materials? So the, this is a, a term that's become quite commonplace uh, in both theoretical and experimental physics. It's obviously a, a maybe a tr becoming more attractive to mathematicians because of the uh, topological in the title. So you can ask, uh, you know, can we imagine a world where you can construct beneficial new technologies such as full-fledged quantum computers or even miniature MRI machines but where material imperfections in the components do not matter. You know, as you try to uh, shrink the length scale of, of technologies, you know, it's, it's the ability to uh, engineer a material perfectly or to get performance uh, while engineering it imperfectly are questions that come up sort of in, in, in the real world. And topological materials um, promise engineering innovations where imp imperfections don't matter. So, fine defects in geometry don't matter because all that matters is the topology. So let's try to explain um, a little bit of, of this. So maybe we can ask how, how do such materials work? So the starting point is something that we call the quantum Hall effect. So certain materials at very, very low temperatures and in the presence of say an intense magnetic field uh, exhibit a, a curious property. So the conductivity profile uh, is, a, is a step function. So here is um, um, sort of a graph of, of conductivity or rather resistivity um, called the Hall resistance versus the strength of a particular, of a magnetic field applied to a particular uh, material. And as the, um, as the magnetic field increases in strength, we see that the resistance uh, is also increasing, but uh, in, in a kind of stepwise way, there are plateaus and sudden jumps. And so this, uh, this curious um, uh, sort of graph that you see instead of sort of a, a more um, linear graph, let's say, or, or you know, just something uh, you know, less like a step function with these sudden jumps, this behavior uh, is part and parcel of the, the quantum Hall effect. So these, these steps uh, occur at, at uh, certain values. So there's a there's a fundamental parameter here, which is uh, h over e squared. Um, so that's that's a fixed number of, of relevance to physics. Um, but uh, you know, in the denominator of this is an integer uh, that is that is increasing, and this is controlling this k is controlling the steps. And so we say that the conductivity or the resistivity is quantized as a result. Now this was all physics, but you know. If you bring a mathematician into the room, they might ask a question like, well, I see some natural numbers. Do they count something? I think that's a reasonable question for us to ask. And uh, let's, let's try and answer that question. But if we're going to do that, we're going to have to bring mathematics into the picture in a more substantial way. So we can ask, is there a mathematical model that underlies uh, this, this effect? So, you know, if you try to come up with, um, with a sort of simple model of conductivity, you might say that, well, let's just, you know, keep it simple and constrain ourselves to two dimensions. So maybe I have some material that uh, is best modeled by, by the real plane. And, you know, maybe it's, it's crystalline in its internal structure. That's also a reasonable assumption. And you can say that, well, uh, mathematically, you know, I'm putting a lattice on, that, uh, on this plane. So I have some, let's say, parallelogram lattice, and this might be a model of a highly crystalline 2D material. And electrons moving or hopping on this lattice um, are described, you know, the, the motion of electrons is, is you know, considered to be a quantum mechanical phenomenon or a phenomenon governed by quantum mechanics. And so the fundamental equation here is the Schrodinger equation. So here we have an operator H, uh, the Hamiltonian, and um, our solutions are what are called the wave functions, phi. And these are functions of, say, position in the plane. 
And this is really an eigenvalue uh, problem. So I have some differential operator and I have, uh, I have a, a, a value here, E, which is the, if you like, an eigenvalue for this, uh, this operator H. And so you want to find solutions of this eigenvalue problem. Well, the first thing we're going to do is we want the equations, um, you know, whatever this, this H is, we want this equation to have something to do with the lattice structure, not just with, with the plane, but we want it to respect the lattice. And so what we do is we, we choose an H uh, that, uh, that there's a part of this H which is uh, called the potential. And we assume that this potential is periodic with respect to the lattice. So the physicists would call that an ansatz. And it turns out that, uh, that the wave functions, the solutions, uh, are quasi-periodic um, if we make a particular transformation of uh, the independent variable here. So uh, instead of looking at position x, uh, we look at, uh, at a related variable k, which is the momentum. And in this, this perspective, the wave functions become almost periodic. So what does that mean? So this, you know, moving from position x to momentum k is, is uh, essentially a Fourier transformation. And when I look at the wave functions in, in this variable k, the quasi-periodicity means if I move to another lattice cell, if my solution in this, say, fundamental cell was uh, phi of k, then in a nearby cell, it's phi of k multiplied by some factor, some predictable factor, which we call the phase factor. And this R, R, K is determined by how many cells we moved away from the fundamental cell. The point being that if you understand what's going on in the fundamental cell, you understand everything. Well, this means that um, we might as well consider what's happening on a torus. In Can fact, I quickly on a, ask a question? Oh, of course. Yeah, just quickly, could you explain that phase factor, how you uh, detect it? I mean, how is, what, what, what is the characterization of that offset? So, so this phase factor uh, comes up in, uh, in what we call Bloch's theorem. So this is the theorem that uh, says that all of the solutions to this appropriately periodic uh, Schrodinger equation are, are uh, quasi-periodic. So this, um, you know, this, this phase factor, um, it's, it's key that it's unitary. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, I could... Yeah, I guess as a mathematician, yeah. I sort of understand it in the context of, of deriving it uh, as, as, you know, in terms of proving Bloch's theorem. The uh -huh. physicists, though, interpret it in terms of, um, in, tem in terms of Aharonov-Bohm phases. So this is, uh, th these are sort of loops that are, are threading, um, you know, the topology of, of this surface that we've reduced to. Mm -hmm. But so you, you could consider these, you know, as cycles or, or, or physical uh, vortices that, you know, are, are sort of uh, wrapping this, uh, this torus. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, sort of more, more comfortable with the, with the mathematical side of this, but there is a, a physical interpretation for these phase factors, which has to do with the, these uh, aharonov bohm vortices or, or phases. Uh -huh. and, and if you choose k's which are rational, is that something which kills off the offset or that's it's, it's always there? Uh, that's a good question too. You know, the, the physicist will do this, you know, I'm, I'm choosing, you know, a generic lattice here, but the physicist will almost always take, uh, you know, kind of a, a unit lattice, a unit square lattice, or, or at least mm -hmm. just a square lattice. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah. Um, and I suppose that, you know, the rationality or the irrationality also has some effect on this. Yeah, okay, thanks a lot, that's useful. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, I think from a geometric point of view, um, you know, we get a reduction to a torus. Um, you know, we really only have to understand what's going on in a particular, in, or in a fundamental cell. And, you know, we, we can replace the picture with, with this. And, you know, what we have is some elliptic curve, because I chose some particular lattice, maybe the square lattice, and, uh, you know, really this other torus, the momentum torus is the Jacobian of E, which for geometers is, is you know, the space of line bundles or the space of rank one flat connections um, on the, you know, associated to this original curve. And, you know, we can think about Fourier really as, as what's called the Abel Jacobi map. And so we can see here, there's a hint of, of algebraic geometry and, and, and differential geometry that maybe isn't normally associated with, uh, with condensed matter uh, going on here. 
And, uh, you know, uh, an, an important feature to this theory is that, you know, if I pick a particular value of K, I have an associated um, you know, sequence of eigenvalues. These are the, the energy levels, uh, or, or if you just like the, the eigenvalues that, uh, that we get from the eigenvalue problem. Um, and, you know, I stopped at three just because I can't really do any more, but I mean, this, this, uh, this goes on, they're, uh, they're ordered. And, you know, if I, if I vary K, I'm also going to vary these eigenvalues and that's going to form a sheeted structure over this Jacobian torus. And, uh, you know, if I take, you know, some, um, let's just say some, some line, you know, some curve or line of, of K values and sort of look at this from the side, if you like, the picture might look like this. And, you know, here's, here's two, you know, different uh, possibilities you know, topologically, uh, maybe they're really the same. I just, uh, I have, um, you know, this, this lower region represents a, a whole bunch of these, these eigensheets and this upper region is, a, is the rest of them. These are the ones that are, are occupied by electrons and, uh, you know, electrons with these energies and these ones up here, the, the so-called unfilled uh, bands, uh, you know, aren't occupied. And then same in this picture. The, the only difference between them is that there's this other dotted line this one happens to be completely between um, the filled and the unfilled uh, sheets. And this one is, is sort of intersecting both of them at the same time. This, um, you, can, you should think about this as a mathematical picture on which I drew an extra dotted line that has physical significance. That's the Fermi level or the electrochemical potential. This has to do, this is measured from the exact material that we're talking about, whereas everything else is, is coming purely from the equations. But the positioning of this line in, in respect to the, um, to the bands uh, determines whether this is an insulator or a metal. So in this case, the gap, the spectral gap between this part of the spectrum and that part of the spectrum is such that we can't get electrons moving from the filled bands to the, the non-filled bands. But here, um, the positioning is such that they can make a jump. So the positioning of the electrochemical potential squarely between uh, you know, uh, two sheets um, decides whether the material uh, is going to insulate or whether it's going to conduct. Uh, and so you know, th this, this is a, um, a fairly uh, you know, robust way since, since it's, it's been you know, assessed experimentally that the model is correct. This has become a, a pretty robust uh, you know, prediction of, of how a, a material is actually gonna behave in the wild. So as long as, to summarize, as long as there's a gap around the so-called Fermi level between the filled bands and empty bands for all K, the material will be an insulator. Um, and the existence of this gap, in a sense, is a topological uh, property. And this is exactly why topological conductivity is so robust. It doesn't really matter how this, this quantum surface, this energy surface changes, so long as the Fermi level can always fit between these bands. Now that, now that we see where some of the topology might be coming from, uh, it was conjectured as early as 1982 by Thules, a physicist, that uh, the quantum Hall numbers count the genus of a particular surface, a surface created by these energy bands. You should think of this, uh, those of you, you know, who think in algebra geometric terms should think about this as a branched cover, um, maybe with infinitely many sheets of, the, uh, of a torus, of an elliptic curve. Um, you know, you can get away with thinking about a smaller number of sheets because we really cared just about filled and unfilled. But this really is becoming a, a kind of algebra topological problem. So if I go back to, uh, to this uh, picture, so this, uh, these sheets over the Jacobian, uh, you know, if I stand, if I pull out, uh, you know, from, from these, uh, this little bit of, of the uh, points that I'm plotting, you might see something like this. This is an actual uh, sort of uh, figure generated by, uh, by computer taken from, uh, from a topological materials paper. And if you pull out you know, further away, really you know, you're getting a, some uh, compact surface with some genus. And you know, this, uh, this genus is closely related to the, the quantum Hall numbers that we saw uh, at the very beginning. And so here's a, here's a, a cartoon that was made by the, the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences. All right, could I Illustrate. quickly ask one more question? Yeah, of course. Yeah, could you make the connection? I've always wondered about this between this uh, Dirac point 
in this topological structure you're showing. So the direct point is when you have this kind of intersection of cones structure you showed. Right, right. That's a great question. And, you know, I'm going to admit to you that, you know, some, some aspects of that are things that I'm, I'm figuring out myself, but, um, you know, well, that's, well, I, I'm glad to know that in the following sense, I've been trying to understand that issue for yeah, quite you know, some time and I've never really quite managed to grasp it in, in the various talks I've seen. So obviously there's something subtle there, but it's connected to this uh, genus count. So that's, that's interesting to know. Yeah, no, and I'll give you sort of my take on it. Um, you know, my, my paradigm, as you've probably detected, has been to try and take things that have been uh, appearing in, in this world of topological materials and, and try to make them as mathematical and algebraic. Yeah, no, I can see that. I mean, I love what you've done so far. It's extremely informative the way you describe that. I mean, one, one suggestion, which is only just an inclination, is that if you took the energy band E1 and E2 mm -hmm. and you had them actually crossing, then that, that's referred to as a Dirac point, I okay. guess. Exactly. And, yeah. and the, so that's a topologically robust thing. Mm -hmm. the, the question is where that point sits relative to the, uh, sorry. Oh, no problem. Uh, uh, <laughs> but that's a topologically robust thing, but I guess it's the. Yeah, no, it, it's, uh, this is interesting. so yes, I was going to say that um, <laughs> the Dirac point. The location uh, of that point relative to the Fermi level. Yeah. yeah, so so these Dirac points are, are yes, they're, they're really points of branching or ramification in, in these sheets. And so mm -hmm. that, that does have uh, an effect on the, on the physics. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, you, you, I think that, you know, you can sort of play this game of, you know, do I need the sheets to be completely separated or can I have sort of ramification, you know, at, at a very far, uh, far away value of K? Mm -hmm. um, in, in which case, you know, uh, there's a long stretch where the bands are appropriately separated. And I think, you know, what really matters is, you know, is your, your Dirac point sort of very finite or is it, is it essentially off at infinity? Mm -hmm. And so this... Well, uh, let me not hold you up anymore, but thanks for, thanks for that. Yeah, but, but you know, th these, these features are important definitely as you, um, as you look further into the geometry of the situation, um, for sure. But... Yeah, you know, I have a big interest in, in, in ramification um, of, of branched covers in regards to, uh, to topological materials. Yeah, so this, this cartoon um, is, uh, is essentially, you know, just, just to illustrate this, this idea of, uh, you know, electrical conductance is, is somehow proportional to genus and, uh, you know, illustrated with, with various objects uh, that, that you might uh, count, uh, count holes in. And the reason this is produced by the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences is because in 2016, there was a Nobel Prize for topological materials, which was great to see topology in the title of a Nobel Prize. And the person I mentioned, Thules, um, who conjectured this relationship, was one of the three winners that year. And I should say that, you know, that this is real uh, and this, you know, led to the, the Nobel Prize. This is real in the sense that, you know, there are materials that under the appropriate, uh, the appropriate conditions uh, will um, will uh, sort of exhibit uh, topological conductivity. So, um, you know, not just the quantum Hall effect, but also the anomalous quantum Hall effect, where you, where you do not need um, the, uh, the sort of intense magnetic field to coax this out. And uh, here is the Nobel Prize, uh, you know, a committee uh, explaining uh, on stage about this by by ripping apart pastries, and. Uh, you know, if you look closely at this slide, you'll see that there's something a little bit wrong. So in the top corner, they made a little bit of a mistake with topology. No one's, no one's perfect. Uh, it's good to know they're human too. And uh, here's an article from Nature from 2019. Strange material, topological materials popping up everywhere physicists look. Uh, so this is really a, a hot area. So, you know, what's, what's next in this? Well, uh, you know, as we, this very reductionist point of view, a topological material is really a geometric structure over a torus whose topology determines its uh, physics. And as we said, you know, this is a very familiar idea in algebraic geometry. We have a branched cover of, of an elliptic curve. Well, you know, a mathematician might stare at this again and say, well, you know, I saw where that torus came from, but what if I could replace that uh, that initial torus uh, that, that was my uh, reduced position space with something higher genus? You know, it's a, a great question. And um, you know, this is now active research and, and things that we're working on quanta. Um, you know, we want to generalize uh, by replacing the original Euclidean lattice with a hyperbolic one. 
to the hyperbolic plane now instead of the Euclidean plane, and we want to tile it by four gigons and uh, get a reduced position space that is a genus G surface. So here's a picture of a Poincaré regular octagon. I'm sure many of you have seen this sort of picture before, and uh, this will produce a genus two uh, surface. So as I said, we tile by four gigons, but now we have to choose um, we choose a, a potential that is, is periodic with respect to this kind of tessellation. And then uh, what you can show is that there exist wave functions that are quasi-periodic in, uh, in momentum again. So um, this is a recent paper of Joseph Macheco. Joseph is a condensed matter physicist and myself um, from August last year, where we, uh, we, we find such wave functions. And what we show is that the position space, as you expect, is, is the genus G surface. However, the momentum space now um, you know, is indeed the Jacobian, but this is a 2G dimensional torus. So on the momentum side, things stay uh, Euclidean, but uh, go up in dimension. We're getting a, uh, as we increase the genus of the position space, we increase the, dim the dimension of the momentum space. And what we show also is that new energy surface behaviors are possible. So we illustrated this for a very particular surface. We took a, the most symmetric uh, octagonal tiling, uh, the, the so-called Bolza surface. And for our, uh, if you're curious, for our uh, uh, periodic potential, we use the generalized uh, Eisenstein series. And uh, the, the quasi-periodic wave functions that result are really automorphic functions uh, for this, uh, for this uh, generalized series. So there's a lot of number theory that comes into, uh, into play as well. Um, as you might expect with, with um, you know, considering really hyperbolic geometries. So this is uh, you know, interesting work in progress. I should say, um, since it came up in the very nice questions that, that are getting during this, uh, we don't have a block theorem. You know, the, the spectrum here, if you like, is very, very noisy, as you might expect in the hyperbolic case. Um, we just have the existence of, of some nice wave functions. Um, you know, can, so is there hyperbolic matter then is the question that comes from this. And the answer is, well, uh, actually before our hyperbolic band theory, um, the year before, um, this was published in Nature. So this is a, this is a, if you like, an artificially engineered uh, photonic um, hyperbolic circuit. So this is um, this is based on a heptagonal uh, tiling of the plane, and this is photonic rather than electronic. So this is, uh, if you like, you know, moving photons around. But um, the, this is uh, sort of uh, planar waveguides that are moving the electrons around, and they've been tuned in such a way that different parts of this uh, wafer have different strengths than others. And this is a way of trying to mimic hyperbolic uh, geometry in, in Euclidean space. So, you know, it's like some distances are different than others because some, some, uh, some of the tunings are stronger than others in this device. So if you like the, the work that we've been doing at Quanta provides the mathematics behind this chip that you see. Are the photons confined in those circuits or are they extensive? Uh, I believe they're confined. Yes. So that's like, a, that's like a graph structured in that sense. Exactly. And that, that exactly. So the graph, uh, the, and there is a graph um, sort of theoretic uh, part of this, this engineering that they relied on heavily. So a hyperbolic metric on a graph. Yes. Fantastic. Very interesting. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, this is the work of Alicia Collar and her collaborators. So she's at, uh, uh, she was at Princeton and now is at Maryland. And so, you know, there are all kinds of questions here. So which kinds of hyperbolic lattices and circuits can be engineered? Uh, can we do electronic ones, for instance? Can they be grown as films or printed uh, in 3D? You know, do they occur naturally? Are some combinations of, of, uh, of constituent elements better than others, just like for, for uh, topological materials? Can they be discovered by machine learning? So there's a big game that's being played of trying to predict uh, new, new quantum matter uh, by loading sort of training sets of Hamiltonians. So there's a lot of potential for collaboration between mathematicians, physicists, engineers, computer sciences, uh, scientists, and uh, potential for uh, student involvement at every stage. And, um, you know, just to... Um, you know, I mentioned earlier the, the synchrotron, you know, once you think you have a, a hyperbolic material, then you can use the, uh, the light source to, um, so th this whole facility is, is the size of a football field on the USAS campus. And, uh, you know, they're uh, sort of specialized uh, 
devices here and, uh, and uh, you know, scientific personnel who can analyze uh, you know, exactly what kind of uh, connectivity be uh, behavior is, is occurring uh, in very fine detail. So that's a, a very forward looking thing that, that might be done. But again, another exciting opportunity for uh, pure mathematicians to sort of get away from the chalkboard and, and uh, see more, uh, more experimental uh, life. So this was a big, uh, just now, just I wanted to show some things, you know, activities that the, the center has had. So this was a big summer school in uh, summer uh, 2019 that we had on uh, algebraic geometry and high energy physics, sort of with a view to maybe using uh, some techniques to low temperature physics, condensed matter physics. So the Nima Arkani uh, Hamed came to Saskatoon uh, from the Institute for Advanced Study and, and gave a special lecture. And uh, we also had a, a separate special lecture. Uh, the uh, Peter Shirk Lecture in Geometry is associated to our center now. So as an opening event, uh, Dan Freed from UT Austin came and spoke about homotopy theory and condensed matter. Um, yeah, and uh, I just wanted to say uh, that uh, we're also thinking about outreach. And I realized that my audio wasn't working at the beginning because I had a video that I wanted to play. And uh, so I'm not going to do the video because I think it's going to steal the audio again uh, away from me. But, uh, you know, we're, we're working on the problem of how do we communicate the story of topological materials without, uh, without equations and without words even for the general public. And so in Unity and Blender, I have a, a student, uh, Brandon Pillar, I want to give a shout out to. He um, has been working on this problem. Uh, you know, he's, he's been creating interactive displays that might go on, say, a large iPad, um, where people can, you know, uh, sort of stretch materials, uh, you know, poke holes in them, create uh, create genus, and this would be connected to an Arduino light board. And say, as you as you, you just learn it, you see that there's a shape there, uh, there's a donut there. You know, you start manipulating it with your with your hands. Uh, you know, you, you, you stretch it and then, you know, it, it pops into genus two um, and then, you know, uh, a light goes on, more lights go on and people infer, you know, the relationship between, uh, between genus and conductivity that way with no words, no, no equations, uh, nothing. So um, that's a work in progress. I had a video for that that uh, Brandon uh, kindly provided, but I don't think uh, it's going to, it's going to work correctly with the presentation, but uh, that's it. And uh, thanks so much. And I think we probably went a bit over time. So thanks for your patience. Well, we thank Steve for that wonderful talk. And um, how about questions for Steve? I'll stop the share so I can, I can see people. Thanks for the uh, clapping hands. Always appreciate it. That was really fascinating. Any... Um, I asked a question while people are thinking that the, the, the material in the hyperbolic case of this, um, this, uh, graph you showed us of the, um, uh, the graph of the photo, this, this is the photon, um, uh, potential that you saw. Mm -hmm. You were, you were saying at the beginning, um, what has been done in the, um, Euclidean case, the, the, the materials are being studied at different temperatures. So is the idea that, um, or how much is known about um, what happens in, in the case where you now have higher genus um, and whether or not, you know, some of the things people are building require um, really sub-zero temperatures. Is there anything known about like these hyperbolic uh, materials allowing for like materials that that might actually be built <laughs> and not that's uh that's an awesome uh question uh caleb uh and i and i, I didn't want to give uh false promises but now that you're asking it as a question i can sort of muse a bit that one of the you know why you know from a math point of view this is very very you know interesting that uh certain features of algebraic geometry come up in in condensed matter where we've never seen them before you know we all know about high energy physics you know has a, a life that's intertwined with with algebraic geometry but um seeing this in condensed matter is great but what is the you know what is the selling point for the physics community potentially or even the engineering community and uh the answer there you know exactly that you know there's a chance that 
these uh, materials will have robust um, sort of, you know, control over conductivity at higher temperatures. Now, higher temperatures you know, doesn't necessarily mean room temperature. But if you can go from minus 270 degrees Celsius to minus 260 degrees Celsius, uh, that's a big improvement, actually, in, in this arena. And the idea here is that, um, you know, if something is perfectly crystalline from a Euclidean point of view, um, and, and, you know, you start to heat it up, then it's, it's going to, you know, that crystal is, is melting. And, you know, that, that is impacting uh, the conductivity and the, the sort of robustness, the protection, the topological protection of, of this conductivity. But maybe as a material, uh, as a crystal is melting, maybe in that you know sort of first uh, you know first step of melting, um, you know one might uh, think that uh, a hyperbolic crystal um, is something like a melted Euclidean crystal. That's that's sort of the idea here. That you know uh, from from a you know maybe a, a melting Euclidean crystal is uh, is still regular. Uh, from a hyperbolic point of view, maybe for you know just just a little bit, and uh, that gain in temperature uh, has immense applications. I think for especially for quantum computing, in, in terms of uh, you know what what can be uh, achieved with uh, qubits uh, that are manufactured from from topological materials. So you know can you manufacture um, qubits from hyperbolic materials, and can you have them uh, running a little bit warmer? Than you would, uh, you know, normally. Um, you know, I, I was, you know, for instance, uh, IBM quantum computers. Uh, these these run, uh, you know, not even a degree above uh, absolute zero. So you know, anything you can you can gain uh, in this game is is uh, is appreciated, and that's definitely one of the motivations from a physical point of view of um, of looking at. Uh, a topological materials, uh, sorry, a hyperbolic materials rather.